May Lord give you his peace. Today is Gospel Reflection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his apostles, Behold, I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves. But beware of men. They will hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will be led before governors and kings for my sake, as a witness before them and the pagans. When they hand you over, do not worry about what you are to speak or what you are to say. You will be given at that moment what you are to say. For it will not be you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will hand over brother to death, and the father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but whoever endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to another. Amen, I say to you, you will not finish the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, after that reading, some people would say, so what's the good news, right? So the apostles are still receiving their instruction from Jesus. They're being sent out to the uh, lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, they're to carry no money bag, no staff, no second tunic, uh, no carrying bag, no, uh, no sandals. They go out and preach the word of God, as I mentioned yesterday. And now Lord tells them, or Lord tells them to be prepared for what might come, that they are going out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Now think about this. Our Lord just told to bring nothing for the journey, no money, no sack, no staff, uh, no belt, uh, no sandals. They're going out there completely defenseless. So they're going out like sheep among wolves. And so the Lord told them, tells them to be as cunning as serpents and as gentle as doves. In other words, to depend upon the Holy Spirit, to guide them with wisdom, with understanding, with counsel, with prudence on how to act, to trust in the gift of the Spirit, but be smart about it and be gentle in how one approaches. Remember, the goal is not just to preach the gospel. The goal is for the people to receive the gospel. That's the goal. I can get up and give a hard-hitting sermon and just punch it down and tell all the truth and say, ha! I said it. And everyone goes, yeah, well, to heck with you, we're gone. What good did I do? Well, I put a notch in my belt and I told the truth. But did I win converts for Christ? Did I win converts for Christ? It could have been a brilliant sermon, but it didn't have the gentleness of a dove that I didn't do much. When we present the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have to present the fullness of the truth. The fullness of it. And we should speak in such a way that the people we're speaking to are going to be able to receive the Word of God. So I always say, it's like you give uh, medicine to a child. If the medicine doesn't taste good, um, you shove it down their throats, they're going to throw it up. If you mix it with too much water, you water it down and it's ineffective. But if you mix it with honey, well then they can swallow it. So it's all a matter of how we present the gospel to a culture, to a people, to individual persons in such a way as they can receive it. So we need to be as shrewd as serpents and gentle as doves so we're able to give the fullness of the truth in such a way it can be received by those we preach to. That's the goal. It's not just simply saying, gee, okay, I did it. I gave them hell, right? Well, what good was that if they still wound up going to hell? Right? The goal was to give them hell in such a way as it scares the hell out of them, and it draws them to heaven. It draws them to God. It draws them to faith. It draws them to truth. That's the goal in preaching the Word of God to bring them to Christ so they can receive Christ. Now, our Lord is very clear to the apostles that not everyone's going to receive the Word. Fact. He even said in the Sermon on the Mount, his very first, very long sermon, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake, 
And for my name's sake, the kingdom of heaven is there. So there is this promise of persecution that we will be blessed if we are persecuted for the name of Christ. So he promises that is going to come. He even says at the Last Supper, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they hated me, they will hate you. So the Lord tells us this is going to happen. And so he's preparing the apostles for this. He says, beware of men. They will hand you over to courts. They will scourge you in their synagogues. And you'll be led before governors and kings for my sake as witnesses before them and the pagans. Now, in this first apostolic journey that Jesus is sending the apostles on here in chapter 10 of Matthew's gospel, the apostles go out in twos and everything's just fine. They don't run into the opposition. They're not scourged. They're not arrested. They're not beaten. Matter of fact... When they got back, everyone was so happy. They're like, Lord, you know, even the devils were subject to the name, your name. And the Lord's like, yeah, I saw a Satan fall like lightning from the sky. Like, they didn't run into this. So the Lord warned them, but they didn't run into it. And the second journey he sends them out on, again, they don't run into it. After the resurrection, after the descent of the Holy Spirit, that's when the apostles begin to face opposition. That's when they really have to face suffering, persecution, scourging. We think about how Peter and John were arrested not long after the, the ascension of our Lord into heaven and the descent of the Spirit. They were in the, uh, they're preaching, they were arrested, they were taken in, they were warned not to preach in the name of Jesus, and they did. And then the twelve apostles themselves, minus Judas, were arrested, and they were taken in. They were scourged, forty lashes minus one. They kept preaching the word of God. They were brought before all kinds of people and all their persecutions. Peter suffered many things over his time. St. Paul doesn't brag about all of his sufferings, but he certainly tells us all of his sufferings that he went through. And so it did in fact happen when the early church faced such persecution. And actually for the first 300 years of the early church's life, she was growing under persecution. One only has to visit Rome and go down to the catacombs and see the tombs of martyrs or, um, you know, or read the lives of the saints and read the, how many of those first early members of the church suffered everything for the sake of Christ. Little children even, suffering for the love of Christ. We look at the church, whenever it goes to a particular new nation, a new place, immediately it's not accepted and there is those who shed their blood for Christ. In some nations it continues to this day. Uh, such as in China, they're still being persecuted for the faith, and various Muslim countries still being persecuted for the faith. Um, but whenever the gospel first arrives on the soil, it receives that persecution, and people die for Christ. It happened here in the United States. When the uh, Jesuits went up to the uh, upstate New York, they died at the shrine. There, what we call the Shrine of the North American Martyrs in Auraysville. Uh, in California, there was a friar who gave his life there during the days of Juniper Sarah. Down in Georgia and Florida, the Franciscan martyrs down there, uh, they were killed by the Native Americans. Um, and that blood of the martyrs, like in the United States, like everywhere else, becomes the seed of Christians, becomes the seed of the church. And so we should not be surprised when there is persecution, uh, but we should never also fear persecution because the Lord promised us it will come. And our Lord tells us not to be afraid of it, particularly what we're going to say when we get caught in those situations. Now, I'm thinking about this right now with regards to our situation today. There are many, many, many Christians, many Catholics today who are very afraid of an upcoming persecution. And their fears are not uh, without reason. You look at Canada, where we have six churches in Canada the past a week or so was, were burned to the ground. Uh, we've had various statues of our images of Our Lady, of Our Lord desecrated just recently in the United States this past year. Uh, many of them across the country. Uh, even the statue of Blessed Juniper Sarah, the founder of California, blood thrown on him, burnt, statue destroyed. So what we see in the culture, such a changing culture with values contrary to Christianity being pushed upon us. And we wonder, is it coming for us? Is the persecution coming our way? It could be. It could be, um, and very might, likely might happen. Uh, we certainly see the, the Christianity being persecuted in various ways. And there's some reaction among Christians to do stuff like get guns and get somehow get ready in some sort of uh, militia battle, I guess. Some people are thinking about that possibility. How are we going to defend ourselves? Not people are doing it. They're thinking about it. Like, what are we going to do if this happens? Um, do, we, do we have a small Christian militia? Do we fight? No. 
our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that was never the answer. I mean, there were some cultures and some times like the Cristeros where they fought back, and yes. But we as Catholics, we know death is not the end. We know that life here on earth is not the end all and be all. A hundred of people, uh, percent of people who live still die. Um, and, you know, we're going to go to our Lord one of these days. Uh, to shed our blood for Christ, there is no greater glory than that. If you've seen the movie For Greater Glory, you know, there's that one incident where uh, Blessed Jose comes in and he says to Father Cristobal, please hide, have to hide. He says, oh, Jose, I'm too young, too old to hide. And he says, no, please, they're coming for you. And he said, Joselito, there's nothing more, there's nothing, no greater glory than to give one's life for Christ. That's something he remembered when he himself, Blessed Jose, little boy, would give his life for Christ. There is no greater glory than to lay one's down, lives down for Christ. He laid his life down for us. We should not be afraid of that moment. Uh, you think about certain saints who laughed on the way to the persecution. Uh, St. Lawrence, Lawrence the deacon, who was being burned alive with the, uh, the grill, grilling him alive, and he said, flip me over, I'm done on this side. Or Thomas uh, More, who said, uh, I die the king's loyal servant, but God's first. Or the nuns, in, uh, Carmelite nuns in France, who were singing on their way uh, to be executed, giving their lives for Christ and for the end of the reign of terror. So we as Christians, we don't fear this. We expect it. Our Lord told us it would happen, and so we should not be living in cowering fear, trying to figure out what we're going to do. Our Lord says, do not worry about what you are going to say. Don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit will give the grace necessary. Form in one's heart that desire for martyrdom. Form in one's heart that desire to give one's life for Christ. Form in one's heart that desire to lay down one's life for Him. Out of love for Him. And out of love for the one who's taking your life. We should be willing to even to die for the one who's taking our life. In other words, to offer our life for them so that they can receive the grace of conversion. To love even our enemy who's taking our life. I used to tell the brothers that, um, you know, you're ready to go to the missions to the Muslims when you're standing there with a the scimitar at your neck and you're able to give your life for Christ and look into the eyes of the one holding the scimitar and love them and give your life for them. When you love them enough to die for them at their hands, then you know you're ready for the missions to die like Christ. And so we should not be afraid of what may come. It happens, it happens. Be at peace. And we look at other martyrs and how they responded. I was just reading the Franciscan Saints of the Day. This is the Franciscan Book of Saints here. And yes, two days ago, we had Blessed Emmanuel Ries and his companions who were in the uh, Orient, and they were, um, uh, were going to get the die for Christ. And uh, the Turkish authorities came in, and uh, so uh, Father, um, how, what's the one I was looking for right now? Father Ruiz, Emmanuel Ries, he, he was... Um, Realized it was coming, they were coming for him, so he went to go to the church to consume the Blessed Sacrament, so they wouldn't desecrate the Blessed Sacrament. So he emptied the tabernacle, he consumed the Blessed Sacrament, and then the guards came in, and he realized his time was over. So what did he do? Uh, he laid his head down on the altar so that they could execute him, and they decapitated him with his head lying on the altar. He gave his life for Christ. Uh, in such a beautiful way. He didn't fight, didn't fight back, didn't cause rebellion. He gently gave his life for Christ because he knew that where he was going was to the glory of the kingdom of heaven and he would win the martyr's crown. We forget about that. The martyr's crown. God gives the beautiful crown of glory to martyrs. I mean, you get martyred, it's a straight ticket right to heaven. And uh, that's why I said when I... If I ever get uh, terminal cancer, I'm going to go to, a, to the missions uh, where I could give my life for Christ and I get that straight ticket in, right? No stop at a purgatory, right into the glory of the kingdom when one gives one's life for Christ. I want to do one last thing here before we end, because uh, a little reflection here on our own culture. It says, a brother will hand over brother to death and a father his child. Now that is going to be in terms of uh, pagan fathers turning over their Christian children because they're Christian. But also we can look at it in the terms of abortion, right? Fathers turning over their children to death. Children will rise up against their parents and have them put to death. Think about euthanasia, right? How many of our elderly being killed by the order of their children? You know, so we have been seeing this uh, reality taking place in our culture of 
parents rising against their children through abortion and children rising against their parents through uh, euthanasia. But uh, just say this and keep this in mind that no matter what we face in the culture, no matter how bad things get, no matter how much the opposition to Christ may be, our Lord told us when they persecute you, He said, you will be hated by all because of my name and whoever endures to the end will be saved. So no matter what happens, no matter what the culture does, no matter what society does, no matter what happens anywhere else, stay faithful to Christ. Stay faithful to the true teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ given to us in the church, in the sacred magisterium, in sacred scripture, and our sacred traditions. Stay faithful to it in all things. Stay faithful to our Lord. Stay faithful in prayer. Stay faithful in virtue. Endure through all things with love. Endure with all things in the way our Lord told us to. Loving our enemies. Doing good to those who persecute us. Praying for those who are persecuting us. Endure it as Christ told us to. And the end, he says, you will be saved. He says not to worry. Not to be afraid of what they can do to the body. Don't worry about him who could put both body and soul in Gehenna. Our Lord tells us, do not worry about what they can do to the body. Don't worry about that. Because the bodies will be raised on the last day. Have faith in Christ. Have faith in His love. Have faith that death is just another passage to the glory of that kingdom. And as St. Cristobal told St. Jose Lito, there is no greater glory than to die for Christ. I guess I'll end with the words of Blessed Jose Ruiz from Mexico. After they, his godfather had turned against him, after his godfather ordered that his soles of his feet should be cut off if he didn't deny Christ, and he didn't. And so the little boy crying out, uh, uh, Viva Cristo Rey, uh, with his soles of his feet cut off, was made to walk miles to his death. And along his path as he headed to his grave, he said to one of his friends, he passed along the, way, along the way, Never has heaven been so easily achieved. Never has heaven been so easily achieved. Profound words from a 13-year-old boy, 14-year-old boy. Profound words. And it's true. If we suffer just a short time in the martyrdom for Christ, how beautiful the glory we will receive. There is no greater glory than to die for Christ. And heaven is never so easily achieved than in the short time that we suffer and give our lives for love of him. So don't be afraid of this culture. Don't be afraid of what can be done to us. Don't be afraid of anything going on around us. Don't plan what to say. Don't plan what to do. Live your life to the full, in the fullness of your Catholic faith. The truth of it, the fullness of it. Live it well. And if God should call you to that moment, where you should give your life for love of him. Love your enemy. Do good to the one who is persecuting you. Pray for them. Offer your life for love of them, as Christ offered his life for love of you. May God bless you, and Mary keep you. The blessing of St. Francis. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his face to you and have mercy upon you. May he turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.